Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being back with us again. Anybody here who hasn't yet taken a seat, please, you are more than welcome. This is the second half of a spectacular collection of discussions, not so much presentations, but certainly conversations around where we are with the electric vehicle revolution. And there is no better place to witness how that is progressing, indeed, how it's accelerating, than in the electric uh, Formula E series. So this is about accelerating innovation in electric racing. And the series has been going, believe it or not, for 10 years already. And you've already heard a few of our earlier speakers talk about some of the innovations, some of the advances that have happened in and around, certainly battery technology, but also motors, inverters, power electronics, the full suite of what makes up the bill of materials for an electric vehicle. So, without any further ado, I would like to invite to the stage my friends from the wonderful Formula E series, Marco, Julia, and Fred. Please join me on the stage. Sit there, Fred, in your legend. That's good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, my friend. So, hands up who has been to a Formula E race? Oh, that's good, isn't it? A few. Good. Yeah. How, many, how many percentage is this? More or less 20? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they're not all a your bit friends, more. are they? Yeah. So, oh, by the way, before we get going, uh, this is very important. We will give you the opportunity for Q&A, questions and answers. Um, so if you have a question from something you either have in your mind already, or you hear from our conversation as we go through um, the discussion, uh, we will have a roving mic, we'll come out to you, and uh, yeah, ask your question. You'll be more than welcome. Um, why don't we, first of all, just properly clarify exactly what each of you do? Because I, I know people can see the title, but what does it actually mean? So, Marco, give us a little kind of, you know, imagine this is a job interview. <laughs> Marco, what do you do? So, here is my second home, by the way, because I spent 25 years in automotive. So, I'm, uh, let me say, a car guy. Uh, I started uh, to be involved as entrepreneur. I had a, a dealership, Fiat Lancia Alfa Romeo Chrysler Jeep. Then I went to, uh, to Fiat um, Chrysler. I was five-year sales director in Switzerland. Then I moved to Ferrari in the loud and fast world. I was Ooh. responsible for Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. And then I went 10 years, and now I'm still in uh, Julius Baer, the, I think the most biggest private banking in the world, and I'm responsible for the whole marketing. And by the way, I started this journey with Julius Baer and Formula E. Wow. Well, that, you've definitely got the right credentials. You've you know, done the right chops for that. I didn't know that, to be honest with you. That's a, that's a great background uh, to have had, so, so welcome. Julia, you're focused, we can clearly see, on sustainability. Yes. And that's a very easy word for us to use. It's a very difficult thing to achieve. So what has brought you to that role, if you can give us a bit more behind that title? Absolutely. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm glad that we are able to discuss amongst friends here uh, about Formula E. So in a sense, my role is to bring to life the mission and the purpose of Formula E, which is to accelerate sustainable human progress. But you need someone that makes it happen. So that's my role on the day-to-day -to, -day to develop the sustainability strategy, which is about environmental protection. We're the first port in the world to achieve net zero since inception. And so this is something that formally is as, as an ongoing commitment on. But it's also about the social impact that we create. We have series of programs in each locations that we race in for the local communities to promote gender equality with Girls on Track or grassroots program for young girls. And it's also about the prosperity and the innovation and the leadership. The racing car that we currently use was the first ever racing car in the world designed with sustainability KPIs, Gen 3. And that's, I mean, something really unique because when sustainability meets sport and they really reinforce each other, that's the utmost that you can achieve in a racing series. 
Yeah, and, and of course, Natalie, in an opening statement about where the FIA is, where it's helping people, maybe that's polite terms for pushing people, but encouraging people, if we can put it like that, to get to net zero by that specific date, um, I think that's important. Julia, thank you. And I also admire the fact that, you know, you have now done this for 10 years. You were at the first season, the series, uh, the uh, Formula E series. So, um, yeah, good for you. You've been on it. Fred, no means, you know, not last for any other reason other than you're a far end of the uh, seating. Um, tell us about Fred and your, your world. You're now in the, you are in the hot seat as a team principal for Mahindra Racing. It's like the buck stops with you, Fred. <laughs> I don't want to panic you, you already knew that. But um, tell us a little bit about how you've got to be in this position now. Some people, first of all, uh, as Julia said, super nice to have uh, this opportunity to explain you more about Formula E. Um, and I think one thing was interesting is to know how many of you came to a Formula E race already. But well, what will be more interesting is to know how many of you want to come after you have come listened back. to us. <laughs> um, but in general, I think on my side, I had that chance um, to develop Formula E on the regulatory and project management side when I was part of the FIA. That was for the last 10 years, probably. Uh, and as you said, uh, some people were thinking I got retired a little bit too early when I went to <laughs> FIA. So they told me, oh, you have to go back to racing. And that's the reason why I uh, decided to join and to move to the, the team principal role. There, the role is quite simple. Mind is there since inception, since the beginning of the championship. It's a brand which is growing very fastly. Uh, it's a brand which has a huge power in India, mostly now, but slowly growing in the rest of the world. And we are in that moment where the group has that chance to launch a full range of electric vehicles. So at that moment, it came to me I, like a big opportunity to be able to join the two sides. On one side, to develop my passion for sport and lead the project management at the very highest level uh, we can reach. And definitely, we want to go for titles. But the second is to create that link with the cars that everybody will be able to buy and uh, to, to be there not only for a brand awareness exercise, but really for a track to road exercise. Yeah, and it's good that you say that because I'm old enough to know there was a phrase that we'd often hear at somewhere like uh, Geneva, uh, race on a Sunday, sell on a Monday. You know, there was a real interconnection between, um, you know, racing, uh, and, and then what happened with, with streetcars. Um, to give you all a flavour, if you didn't know, about where is this sport then at the moment, um, last season there were 16 races. It was watched around the world by more than 225 million people, million viewers. Um, there were 403 uh, overtaking manoeuvres. You can tell I'm reading this from notes. I'm not clever enough to remember these things. Um, and Julia, you'll probably know this for sure. Did it recently take over in that hierarchy of motorsports um, from NASCAR to become the fourth most viewed motorsport in the world? Is, have I made that up or is that Absolutely true? Absolutely correct, yes. Right, okay. Formula is the fastest growing sport in the world, motorsport in the world at the moment. Our trajectory is absolutely going up and up, which right. is fantastic because our sport is put on, if you consider the audience, the audience of Formula is very young. And so what young people want is something that is going to be fast because the attention spam is reduced. They don't, they don't spend hours in front of the TV anymore. Uh, but are you also, thinking of two hours on a Sunday afternoon? Is that what you're thinking of? <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> you said no, it. You didn't. No, I know. I know. Um, and, and the reality also is we've, we are in front of an audience that is asking for a lot more consciousness and Formula is delivering that. It's a sport that is tailored for the future. Yeah. Do you know what, Julia? Hearing you give that answer, you can, you can absolutely tell Julia's, Julia's done this for 10 years. <laughs> She's very good. Um, I've made some notes on comments other people have made. Now, Zach Brown is very well known in motorsport. Right now, of course, incredibly well known <laughs> because he heads up um, McLaren. Um, the McLaren Formula One team, or the McLaren business, I think. Anyway, he recently said, commercially, strategically, and technically key when asked about Formula E. So 
I assume you'd all agree with that. Um, so let me ask you, Mark, I mean, let's pick out one of those commercially then. I mean, assuming he's right, what does he mean by that? Those, just do the commercial bit. You mean the platform formally? Yeah, I mean, you know, if Zach Brown, who is heart and soul, blood and guts in that Formula One world, if he's saying that about Formula E, and let's again put in context, Formula One is, I don't know, 72, 73 years old. Formula E is 10 years old. You know, all, everything in life takes time to develop and grow and, and all the rest of that. Exactly. I, th I think, listen, um, I explained I came from the automotive world and when I was the first time I, I heard from Formula E, I received a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation from my ex-CEO in the time. And I say, hey, electric 2013, electric is it's, 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 it's an alibi. It's, it's not really, really realistic to thinking about uh, uh, um, electric motorsport series. And then when I had the chance to went to London to have the conversation with Alejandro and the time that the, the founder from the Formula E, he explained me all the vision for Formula E. Um, today I'm saying we have the same vision, but and for partners it's extremely important to understand the ingredients. So when you will go out and find the platform to have all the right ingredients, I think Formula E remain one of the best platform you can find because you have a global platform this is extremely important you we race around the world yeah then we have the sustainability angle and this is really strong net zero since the day one thanks julia's uh, work then what is extremely important technology advantage what we we can um, develop in in our series and then uh, go and give them to the to, to OEMs, and then it's absolutely important. All the the, um, the values from this series is is the, an ingredient you cannot find another platform in. Yeah, yeah. And so, so the commercial thing. Let's be frank here. When it comes to an expensive thing like a motorsport, especially the the hierarchy as it goes up, you need that commercial connection because that's money. That's sponsors. Exactly. That's so. You, you mentioned Formula One. I think Formula One, Formula you One, in, in the moment, <laughs> is, is, is a different animal. But Formula E have more better ingredient. This convinced us to jump in in the early stage and also to become an investor because the, the combination is quite unique in the market. So, personally, I think um, Formula E is is what I said. No, the, all the components you have in this platform is, yeah. is absolutely special. Okay, so that, that's a kind of nice commercial perspective on it. So those three terms, commercially, strategically, technically. Fred, inevitably, I'm going to ask you about technically then. Um, it, is it going fast enough, particularly, let's say, the key of any of electric vehicles here is the battery. So where is Formula E now in that journey of developing the batteries? Je I think, you know, Julia said Gen 3 car. Uh, the battery began, I think, with Williams. They made it in record time, 18 months or something. Um, y where are we in what this Zach Brown fella says is really a strong point for, for the formula? What's your answer to the, the technical competence of it? I, I think technical, commercial and strategic at the end are one because what makes sense on the technical side to use this platform to develop the technology. We started with a car uh, 2014, which was not able to race more than 20 minutes, and we were hardly reaching 200 kph. The car we currently use has done so much uh, improvement that you cannot compare anymore the performances. The, there was a transition in between with a car which has been able to double the autonomy, so it means that instead of having a mix of two cars you needed at the very beginning. We had a very, very specific concept at the beginning. Maybe I start there. When we had to sell it and to explain it, Marco has been a clever guy with his CEO to see that there was a future there because we started with a concept where we had to convince people of the fact that we will change the full understanding about motorsport. There will be one car starting the race, stopping middle of the race, and then it's not the driver that we will change, it's the car. We will use a second car to do the second half of the race. Uh, I can tell you that at that time I was at the FIA and to convince the Motorsport World Council that there will be a change of car, not of drivers, 
they ask me two or three times to repeat and explain. Because <laughs> they were just asking, OK, you're crazy. Uh, but, but from there, uh, when we had the first discussion with the manufacturers in general, and that's where I come to technical and commercial, they all understood that this was the way to go. This was the way to start. Because if we were waiting for the technology to be there, we would never start. So then we started. And then because it was so successful, it was sur quite surprising that what was seen as a weakness of the championship at the beginning, two cars needed, became a strength. Because it was super entertaining. And there we come back to what Julia said. The youngs, they liked it. That, that's not motorsport as we knew, maybe. But that's the motorsport they want to see for the future. Short, entertaining, codes of video game in the, in the, in the way you do the show, in the way you, you perform your races. That's what they expect, that's what they like. So that's definitely gone to a strategic aspect of the, of the racing. And when we had to change the car, which was more uh, uh, performant, we had the double the autonomy. So there was no more need of two cars. And that we started to have a question, ah, how can we do now to race without two cars? So what was very difficult at the beginning became something even bit more difficult for the future. We need to invent. And that's at the moment where we invented what we called attack mode. If you all have in mind Super Mario, in Super Mario, when you race with this little karting, you have areas where you go and you activate the super boost. And that was the idea behind attack mode in Formula E, was how can we interpret those codes of video game, put that in a racing format, on the FIA side, put some regulations around and manage that it is done fairly, and that you get that into the DNA of the, of the championship. And that's what happened with Gen 2. We have been able to double the autonomy, increase the performances on, on track, lap times have been better. But on top, we have engaged more with fans because we have been able to bring those video game codes. And when we created the last car, which started one year ago, here now we are with a battery which is able to um, do a race of nearly one hour. So we have 350 kilowatt, but also 250 kilowatt at the front with Ray Gen. So it's a 600 kilowatt uh, battery at the end. And we are able to perform now with a car which is more than 300 kilometers per hour in terms of top speed. But then starts to, that, that starts to create us new uh, headaches in a way, how to keep the entertaining part of racing with a car which is going faster, because we need to keep uh, overtaking. And there started the idea of downsizing the battery that helped us on saving some weight and gain performances, but also put a challenge to the drivers and the engineers. And that's where we come to the technical. We start a race with, we know we cannot finish the race if we go maximum speed. So you have to regen your energy. You have to manage on the racing side how you apprehend the racing aspects. That gives a lot of responsibilities to the drivers, because the way a driver is able to make the difference is in his capacity of being the fastest, but also regenerating a maximum of energy so that he can keep additional right, power. Right. So I'm long, but this is the idea behind. It's where this energy comes from. For me, I, I make no difference between commercial, technical, and, and strategic, because this is all linked. What we just try to create is an entertaining pro program that makes people feeling, whoa, that's different. Yeah, yeah, that, that's great. And, and like I say, Zach Brown, somebody like Zach Brown, doesn't say things like that as little throwaway comments says it for all sorts of reasons, and I'm sure he says it because he believes in it. Um, now, easy, yeah, yeah. So, so the development is happening fast. We're on Gen 3. There'll be, of course, there will, a Gen 4. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot now, uh, Fred. So if you ran a Formula E car on exactly the same track at Monaco, as the Formula, you know, I'm going to ask you, at the Formula One race. Now, I'm not an expert, but I have made a couple of documentaries called Motorsport in the Electric Age, so I've had a chance to meet some pretty useful people. Am I right in saying at the moment, and this isn't triggering a negative point, you'd be about 10 seconds slower, round about? Would that be right? Wow. Uh, that's a question which is the one people would love to hear, we can be as fast, because we probably can be as fast. But we are, we are using in Formula E a lot of aspects which are not pushing extreme performance on aerodynamics, for example. We prefer the car to get on the mechanical grip more than the aerodynamics. Uh, on the same way, we are using a tire, and thanks to Julia push on her side, is that we are not changing <laughs> tires. Hybrids. 
we, we, we are using the same set of tires all along the weekend. That means that we have a tire which is not a slick tire, but mm -hmm. a nearly road car tire. That limits a bit the performance. But if we were putting everything together, including the front powertrain on our side, we probably could get yeah. very close. Now, now, the reason I'm asking, I'm not trying to pitch Formula One against, uh, for sneakily pitch Formula One against Formula E. The reason why I'm saying this is because, as I think we spoke about in some of the earlier panels, um, the internal combustion engine proposition is kind of as good as it's ever going to get. Thermal management, you know, it's best in a, in a Formula One car and anything, in truth. You know, they've finessed uh, regen, you know, KERS was a great revolution in, in all of that. But, but it's only tiny increments of development now to make that car go around Monaco faster. You and your technology is going to go gradually further on and eventually may well catch up. And, and I understand what you mean about it isn't just race pace, it's about the collective things around what we need to do. So, so I, I get that. Um, but one thing I'm, I'm intrigued about, there have been a few drivers who drive both in Formula One and, and in Formula E. I've made a note so I don't forget. Felipe Massa, uh, Jerome D'Ambrosio, and Pierre Gasly. Um, and Nick de Vries. Nick de Vries. De Vries. Yes. And Nick de Vries, <laughs> yeah. So I knew yeah. I'd get it wrong. Oh. Oh. Um. Anyway, I think the, <laughs> and I'm probably going to get this wrong. The, the one driver, I think, who was um, in Formula E before Formula One it is, is Pierre Gasly. Do you talk to them at all and, and just try and learn and benefit from what could we lift from Formula E and put it into Formula One? What could we do vice versa? So that the FIA can be very happy because both motorsports, you know, improve. Is there, do you talk to these drivers much about that? Well, I had not. I think Gasly had only two races to replace Boemi, no? This was yep. the two, two races. It was very I mean. early on. Mm -mm. Uh, but I think um, Frank can tell more, more about uh, Nick because uh, Nick is the, 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 the last example now from Alpha Tauri and then he moved yeah. to, to, yeah. and back to, form of perfect, to Formula E because for him was extremely more, I think this is an indication we can really understand what is the difficult from a from a professional race driver to drive a, dri a Formula One car and, and a Formula E car. I don't know what Nick said. It's, it's more complicated because it's not only to go fast. Well, indeed. It's it's energy management, all yeah. these elements are make to drive a Formula E uh, car more, let me say, challenging. Yes, yeah, well, well, but, but that's, that's, that's all good. Um, so c coming back to the kind of pitch, if you like, around sustainability. People will talk now, and, and we have to embrace it and accept it, that when it comes to making batteries, we have to dig stuff up. You know, minerals out of the ground that have to be processed to put into a battery, for example. But let's not forget, the world around us is either one of two things. We either dig stuff up or we grow stuff for everything in this room. And into include, no one ever talked. The thing that strikes <laughs> me is no one ever spoke about some of the issues around battery uh, mineral extraction, um, cobalt, for example, all the while we had our mobile phones, our computers and everything else. No one mentioned it. It never got any kind of airplay. The moment it's in a battery for an electric vehicle, it's, it's like big news. Julia, how do you reconcile all of these, you know, pluses and minuses that are going on around this transition from, from one industry to another ha, ha, in sustainability terms? It's, it's a very important point. And, and of course, it's tricky, but there are many solutions. All the, let's say, the, the environment from the technical point of view around the battery is growing so fast. So, for example, we've always made sure that the batteries of the car since the very first generation would be recycled <coughs> because this is possible. There are some companies in the world that are recycling batteries <coughs> very efficiently. But what is amazing is that the comparison in terms of the efficiency of recovering the materials in between season one and season 10, lithium, nearly 90% recovery when we started just about 60%. So, and it's a closed loop. So the lithium is going back to the cells that came to be recycled and go, are recreated. Same for the methyl, metals. Nine, almost 97% of the metals are recycled and repurposed directly into new cells. So there is a scheme that is existing and that is efficient. The problem is that people don't know. 
media are not talking enough about it, and there are not enough companies in the world that are able to offer these kind of services. So it's, it's a reality of it's rare, but it's not impossible. Okay, so, so in the same way that some of the technical development, and Peter Rawlinson was pretty graphic and you know, explaining some of the, the incredible progress that's happened, um, you know, whether it's batteries, motors, inverters, w w whatever. Are you saying then that uh, some of that experience and focus on the, on the recyclability of the batteries can then be applied at scale? Because to be frank, you know, if it's a bunch of, Formula E cars every season. It's not a lot of batteries. It's not. not it, it's got to translate to something that scales up a lot bigger. But, but absolutely, that's that's the whole point. That's why we wanted one to showcase that these technological solutions exist, because then it's available to any other manufacturer in the world. And again, you have a couple of big players: one in the U.S., one in Europe, one in China. At the moment, that's that's enough to cover quite a lot of the market in the world. Mm. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so let's get into another aspect of what a race is, because I haven't been to them all. I mean, <laughs> that wouldn't really have been a good thing in a sense to do. But I have been to you know, a reasonable number, uh, mostly in Europe, the ones in London, of course. Um, wh how, can, how can you deliver more of that storytelling of what goes on in a city? I, I've been to some of the events where they, you have a wonderful day before, or a couple of days before, where you get the mayor in, you get all these different mm -hmm. people in. They talk about real issues, and because of the, the, if you like, the halo of Formula E, it gives a platform for people to talk to these things and, and, and makes them change quicker and better. A and again, let's, let's be frank, more and more people on planet Earth live in a, ta in a city, a big urban area. So more and more focus has to be on the sustainability of life in that environment. <coughs> and a lot of that is, of course, about mobility. So are you making enough of that arena in terms of telling the story? Because I don't hear a lot about it in the media and, and the press. It's almost just the race bit, but then you have the other stuff. Is that, can you do more with that? I think the reality is that uh, the beauty of Formula E and then the complexity is that we are many, many things at the same time. And so you have a motorsport that is extremely exciting, very unpredictable in terms of races. And of course, that's how you catch most of the people from a, a B2C audience. But then there's the whole rest of the reality that is a bit more B2B or business to government, where Formula E, going back to the quote of um, Zach Brown, the strategic part is we're going back to the principle why is it so strategically relevant? Because as you rightly said, we have a big problem, climate change. And in climate change, the CO2 emissions that are linked to transportation, 30% of it globally. Mm. Cars being the most, let's say, the most input out of the transport uh, CO2 emissions. And so if you change mm. the reality of cars, making them electric, zero tailpipe emissions, over than 50% less, if not 80% less, overall um, CO2 emissions <coughs> on the lifespan. So you really make a huge difference. Yeah. You improve the air quality in cities. You solve a huge part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, Julia, I think is something that needs uh, much more storytelling around it. The fact that what we're talking about here, and it isn't important to get the, the words right, zero tailpipe emission. Absolutely. I think when we talk about zero emission, it rubs some people up the wrong way when they talk about electric vehicles because then of the supply chain stuff. Um, zero tailpipe emission means exactly what it says on the tin. And, and, no knocks, and no socks, which is what is the biggest issue in terms of air quality for yeah. most of the people. Every year, the equivalent of New York City dies in the world because of air pollution. I know, it's almost unfathomable. You, you see those statistics and you think, are you sure about that? But, but, but it, it sadly is true. I did promise we were going to go and do some questions, Q&A. So has anybody got a question they would like to ask? Good gentleman at the front. Oh, gentleman just there. Yeah, grab that guy first, and then we'll come around to you, sir. So yeah, f just say your name and uh, one, one question, please. Uh, my name's Alex. Uh, question is, in relation to all of the cars being different, I imagine that there's a... C can you put it right up to Oh, now? sorry. Yeah. Uh, in, in relation to all the cars being uh, the same, is there any, or has there been any thought to um, letting the teams develop their own cards and having sort of inter 
uh, team, but more importantly, probably intercompany uh, rivalries. <coughs> so, yep. in a boardroom, yep. sweating. I, I will take. Thank you. I, will, I take this one. Um, so, first of all, the cars are not all the same. Uh, the car is developed in a way to limit costs. So, you have, let's say, 60% of the car which That's is standard, but 40% which is really uh, made by each manufacturer. So right now you have uh, six manufacturers involved, Porsche, Nissan, Jaguar, Mahindra, ERT uh, was NIO before, and uh, the group Stellantis, who is doing two brands with, with this. So the, the, the job we are doing on our own development is huge because you have a lot of work to do on how to make the most efficient powertrain compared to the others, <coughs> and also how you make sure that you develop the softwares around, and that's a big, big point. Great. Great. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen. It should be on. Yeah, it is on. It is on. It's on? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Geneva Motor Show. Thank you for the great panel. Uh, great subjects, great panelists. Uh, being from Saudi Arabia, uh, recently, in the last couple of years, we've seen e-motor uh, uh, racing picking up tremendously. And uh, it has been following. It has a uh, very strong support from the top to the bottom. And uh, we've been very excited about it. Uh, my question is, uh, how uh, are we going to see any uh, improvement in the e-racing with the game, uh, game industry uh, applying the e-racing into the game industry? So the end user could have the feeling of the racers and the ambiance of the whole uh, e-racing uh, events? Thank you. But Thank I, you. I think this is, this is a good question. I think um, Formula E, it's, it's, it's a platform, a motorsport platform to involve OEM since the beginning in a, in, in a quantity you never see in another motorsport series. Also today we have nine totally, six, nine OEMs in, in oh, Formula yes. E. So this means now <coughs> it's important to create this connection. And uh, I think when I hear all the OEMs now, they start really to involve not only the marketing department, also the technical department, and to involve the customer. So to in invite the customer to a race, to see really, hey, this is a technology, you will find this in our road cars. And I think this is a good element we must to promote more. And I think the OEM understand now really to involve more, to also reach uh, the, the, the awareness from Formula E. This is extremely important. Mm. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, if not, I've got a couple. No, we're good. Okay, um, Julia, you'll remember, I do, because I used to come on to Donington before we even started the first season. Uh, we have had female drivers. We, have, we haven't in Formula One. Is there not a golden opportunity, for whatever reason, different cultural approach, you know, different background to where, where the driver pool comes from, et cetera, et cetera? to have more women drivers in Formula E. And absolutely, and that's why we've created Girls on Track. <coughs> so we know there's a problem in motorsport. The reality is that it's a sport that is not designed for women to succeed. The, the hypothesis is that there's no reason why a female would not be as successful as a man, because the ability is the driving capability, not the strengths as such. Simply the cars so far have not been designed in the right way for females to be able to succeed equally as men. So we are increasing the pipeline of talents through Girls on Track, making sure that there's more than 10% of girls that are interested at the bottom of the pyramid when you know that at the very end there's going to be only 10% left. So yeah. mathematically, it's impossible for a girl to make it to the top. So that's the whole point. And, and you have different phases, and that's exactly what we're working on. We want to make sure that on the short term, we're going to be pushing female talents to the very top of the sport. Right. Because Wh you think about the driver, yes, <coughs> but team principal we had. Yeah. And also, you know, the chief mechanic, uh, chief, sorry, chief engineer and so on. Not only the drivers matter in this sport. Mm. No, I, I, absolutely. Well, well I'm, I, I mean, I must make a confession. I've been married nearly 40 years. I will f totally acknowledge this publicly. My wife is much better at multitasking than I am. I can imagine now, given what you said about all you have to do in a Formula E car, my wife would be better driving it than me, <laughs> quite frankly, because I'd be like, don't, don't ask me to do anything else. I'm just driving. 
So, uh, yeah, that, that could be intriguing. And I say that really, I ask that question really because half the world's population are women. It's not a question of being politically correct or trendy or anything else like that. If you've got a talent pool where half of the talent pool is potentially being not ignored as such, but not given the same focus, that's just stupid. That's just not good business and it's not sound kind of practice. Uh, have we got any more questions just before we do the wrap-up? I would not want to miss anyone out if they wanted to ask. Have, have we got one over here? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I missed you over there. I wasn't looking across. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <coughs> My name is uh, Sunil. I just wanted to ask a question. It's kind of around your point when you talk about Formula can, One. Can you put it a bit nearer the mouth? Yeah. Thank you. When you talk about Formula One and how they can make really just small incremental innovations to improve, how big would you say the gap is for Formula E? Because um, it's been around for 10 years, but how, how, how big do you think for the innovation for Formula E is today and to how far could it really go, honestly, like from your perspectives? Good question. Who wants to answer that? I, I would say Sky right now, because w what is probably the game changer is to see that every stakeholder is now concentrated on pushing the limits. I think what, uh, I would say three things. The first thing for me, and um, it was interesting to hear about design and style, the thing which is changing a lot is that up to now, when you were thinking about electric cars, you were thinking of a car which was not necessarily attractive. Now you go to any manufacturer, and I think here is a good show for that, you realize that the car are probably the most attractive, they are electric. That's a big change in terms of what is the potential. And the potential is the same technologically because you have so many new stakeholders concentrated on finding new ideas. I think when you even think about AI and the potential around AI and how it can help on developing new options, you realize that the, the, the chances to find technical solutions in the future, which will help to be totally, probably 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times away in terms of performance to where we are now, is, is definitely the, the potential. So on Formula E, very specifically, we are right now thinking about the ge next generation of car, the one starting from 2026. And we think of cars probably reaching 600, 700 kilowatt, full-time, four-wheel drive, with uh, a, a range which is higher also. So you will, you will get in, in a race format which is very different because you have new technologies coming, because you have uh, new suppliers coming, and new ideas uh, in general, I would say, around architecture, around technology, around chemicals. Um, and if I also look at the different partners we have, in our case, we work with uh, Shell, for example, and they are supporting us in a lot of aspects where we have to think different on how we are cooling the car, how we are getting more efficiency out of all the friction in the car. So th there are so much potential to be exploited that I would say we probably did 10% of the journey. Mm. Yeah, it's a, gr it's a great question. So I, I think this is the point. It, it's going to be a journey of change across the whole industry anyway, not, not just motorsport. But, it, you know, these things are complementary. And, and in a sense, they're in competition with each other, which is really good. You know, the Formula One people want to get better all the time. They're a bit nervous about Formula E getting too good too soon. You know, I know the structure of the contract in terms of exclusivity. You know, some real... Some real Dy you know, dynamics to that that are quite intriguing. Um, but what, what I'd like to say finally, just to sort of wrap things up is, um, I think <coughs> motorsport in the electric age is about so much more than just what happens on a track. It is now about the stuff that's going on around the world in this revolution with uh, energy, you know, the shift to re uh, renewable energy. And no, I don't just mean batteries, I mean power electronics, you know, I mean inverters, motors, all of these things that fit into and sit around the kind of the whole arena of how the world works. So I, I think what you're doing is absolutely the right thing. It's pushing us, pushing motorsport to behave differently. It's not going to rip it up. I don't think necessarily we'll, we'll finish, you know, motorsport is, you know, Formula One will end at some point. I don't think so. I think it has a place, it all has a place within the world we're reshaping and, and re redesigning to be what it needs to be. Um, but enough of all that, because we have another wonderful session to come. Um, but for now, thank you so much, Marco, Julia, and Fred. Can we give them a big round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys.
Enjoy that. Thank you.